Okay, we start before we before the last lecture. We I just recall that the university asked me to submit a list of students who are att planning to attend the final. So I uh, I already asked send you email so ask you to reply confirm me that whether or not you are taking the final, and then I will submit the list as soon as possible. So if you haven't send me email, please send me email as soon as possible and confirming me that you are taking the final. Okay, so now we start today's lecture. So this is the last lecture of the semester. In the last lecture, we discussed the generator of a continuous time Markov chain. So in the last lecture, we derived that we consider we have a continuous time Markov chain xt. Then we show that the transition semigroup has a derivative. And we call this derivative as the infinitesimal generator A. And then we can decompose this continuous time Markov chain into two parts. One part is the jumping process, y, and so one part is the jumping times. So this sequence of j1, j2 corresponds to, to the, mark, corresponds to the time that the mark of, mark of chain jumps. And then it's the jumping process. So this sequence y and memorize where the Markov chain jumps at each jump. And we also derive that uh, the joint law of this jumping time and the jumping process is also known. It can be explicitly written as a function in the infinitesimal generator. So we know that if the Markov chain starts from x, the first jump is jumping to y and the jumping time is greater than t, then we know that the joint law is they are independent and the jumping time is exponential with parameter qx. And for the jumping process, it is a mark of chain and the transition semigroup is given by the infinitesimal generator. So this is what we know from the last lecture. And today we will talk about irreducibility, transience recurrence, and the positive recurrence and the stationary distribution. And then we will see what's the relation to the discrete time case. Okay, first, irreducibility. We say that uh, a continuous time Markov chain is irreducible, even only if its jump process is irreducible. So we have already recalled that Given the continuous time Markov chain, the jamming process is also a mark uh, is also a Markov chain, and it is a discrete time Markov chain. And the jamming and the transition semigroup is given by this infinitesimal generator. And the definition for irreducible is defined in the same way as the irreducible irreducibility for the jam process. So a continuous time. A continuous time Markov chain is irreducible if its jump, jumping process is irreducible. And then we give a lemma. So in this lemma, it says that the following four statements are equivalent. And here we see that the first statement is, the, is meaning that our jumping process is irreducible. And the second is just a translation of the, f uh, of the first. Uh, uh, we just write out the transition matrix explicitly. And the three and uh, fours are the natural property we expect for the continuous time case. Because in the discrete time case, when we define irreducible, we say that for any x, y, there exists the integer n such that it is possible to it is possible to jump from x to y by time m. 
And if we just want to replace this definition for continuous time case, then what we would like to define is for any x, y, there exists a time t such that it is possible to jump from x to y by time t. So this is what we would expect if we just repeat the definition for the discrete time case. And now this theorem says, this lemma says, all oh, this is three, four statements are equivalent. So if we want to define irreducible by, by this fact, it is okay. And if we just define it in the way that the jumping process is irreducible, it is also okay. And they are, the, they are equivalent definitions. Okay, so proof of this, proof of this lemma. So the first item will say that this is the definition for the jumping process is irreducible. And from first to second, this is just the definition, uh, this is just a translation of the first statement, just uh, writing out the transition matrix. And then let us see how to go from two to third, second to third. So it says that if we have a sequence of paths such that, so for any x, y, there exists a sequence such that the semi-group, the infinitesimal generator is all positive. Then we want to study what happens to PTXY. And in fact, we want to show that for any T positive, PTXY is strictly positive. So why this is true? So we first start from a simple case. Suppose that Suppose we only have two points. So suppose we have Q, W, Z is strictly positive. We just have two points, and uh, we know that it is positive to jump from one to another one within one step. Then what happens to P, T, W, Z? So now we see that P, T, W, Z is the probability that our mark of choice starting from W and jump to z at time t. And we know that if this t is between j1 and j2, so suppose that this t is be between j1 and j2, then the event that xt equals z just means we first jump to z. So this is equivalent to say that y1 equals j equals z. And here we already know that we know what's the joint law of j1 and the y1. The only thing we don't know is about j2. But we know that given j1, the difference, so the difference j2 minus j1 is also independent of what, what happens before j1. So we're just... Uh, So S2 is the difference between J1 and J2. S2 equals J2 minus J1. So it's just a holding time of the Markov chain at time Z. So at least we know that this is greater than this one. So if S2 is greater than T, then of course J2 is greater than T. And now we can calculate this prob probability explicitly because we know that this, since this is a Markov chain, S2 is greater than T, is independent of what happens before time T. Okay, 
So for the second probability, we know that J1 is before T and the Y1 is Z. And now S2 is the holding time of the Markov chain at point Z. So the holding time, we know that given the previous uh, jump is to Z, the holding time S2 is just exponential with parameter QZ. So we know that the second probability is just uh, exponential with parameter QZ. And for the first part of the probability, we know that we know the joint law of J1 and Y1. So J1 is an exponential with parameter QW. And for the jumping process, it's just a new Markov chain. And the transition matrix is given by the infinitesimal generator. So now we calculate explicit this probability. And we see that if QWZ is strictly positive, then this probability is positive. OK, so now we have shown that if QWZ is strictly positive, then for any t, PTWZ is strictly positive. And now we'll go back to the general form. So for any x, y, we know that we have a sequence of infinitesimal generator that is strictly positive. Then let us consider what is PTXY. So PTXY is the probability that we start from X, jump to Y at time T. So of course, this is greater than we start from X and first jump to X1, but within time T over N. And for the second step, within time T over N, we jump from x1 to x2. So in fact, this is exactly what we do in the discrete time case. We just decompose this path, and we say that this is bounded from below by this one step jumping, and then for each step, because we have already proved that if Q is a strictly positive, then this probability is strictly positive for any T. So now just we apply the theorem to T over N. So we know that each quantity is strictly positive. And of course, the product of all of them is also strictly positive. OK, so this proves how to go from sec second to third. OK, so here basically we show that if the jumping process y uh, is irreducible, then we know that the continuous time mark of chain is also irreducible. And uh, clearly, third implies four. And now we only need to show that four implies first. So suppose that for x, y, PTXY is a strictly positive for some t. Then how we derive that the jumping process is irreducible? So we need to calculate what's the probability that we start from X, we jump to Y at time N. So we need to show that for some N, this guy is a strictly positive. So what's the relation between Y N equals Y and x t equals y, because this is, this is the probability that we start from x and jump to y at time t. So now we see that if j n is before t and j n plus 1 is after t, then y n equals y just equals x t equals y.
So assume that Jn is before t and that Jn plus 1 is after t. Then Yn equals y is exactly xt equals y. So this is the relation between Yn equals y and xt equals y. And now we're summing over n to the both sides. And here for the right hand side, we see that for a fixed t, we sum it over n. So now we're just decomposing, we just decompose the Markov chain according to jump interval. And we see t is inside which interval, and then we sum it over n. So they are all disjointed events, and we sum it over all possible n. It's just to give us the probability that xt equals y. And we know that from the assumption, this guy is strictly positive. So summing over all possible n, it is strictly positive. Then there exists n such that, so at least one of them has to be strictly positive. And this proves, the, it proves how to go from four to, fourth to first. So this shows that all these four statements are equivalent. So if we want to say a continuous time Markov chain is irreducible, we can easily either say that the jumping process is irreducible or PTXY is strictly positive for all T. So they are equivalent. So this is the first notion, uh, irreducible. Okay. Then we turn to the second notion, transience and recurrence. Okay, transience and recurrence. In the discrete time case, we define that if the Markov chain is transient, is transient, then it means that with our Markov chain starts from X and tau X plus this first return time to X, and if the Markov chain is transient, it means that this probability is strictly less than one, or it is recurrent. Then it means that this first return time is equals one. So if the first return time is finite uh, almost surely, then we can show that in fact for, N, for this vertex x, then the Markov chain will go back infinitely many times. And if the Markov chain go back infinitely many times, then it means that if we consider the set n such that y n equals x, then this is an unbounded set. And now we just define the continuous time Markov chain transients and recurrence according to this criteria. So for continuous time Markov chain, we define that We look at we look at the time that the Markov chain visits a vertex x. If we uh, we we check whether it is unbounded or not. If it is unbounded, then we know that uh, in the discrete time case, it means that we are in the recurrent case. So if it is almost surely unbounded, then we say that the Mark uh, the Markov chain is recurrent. But if probability is strictly less than one, we say that it is transient.
Okay, so this is the definition for a recurrent transient. And then this lemma tells us this motivation is consistent with what happens to the jumping process. So this theorem says if X is an irreducible Markov chain, then if a state is recurrent for the jumping process, then it is also recurrent for the continuous time process. If it is transient for the jumping process, it is also transient for the continuous time process. And since for the discrete time Markov chain Yn, we know that it is either all states are recurrent or all states are, re are transient. So from the above two statements, we know that for the continuous time Markov chain X, it is also the case. So either all states are recurrent or all states are transient. Okay, so this theorem tells us under this definition of the recurrent and the transient, then it is consistent with, with what happens to the uh, discrete time jumping process. So suppose X is irreducible, then we know that a state X is recurrent for the jumping process implies it is also recurrent for the continuous time process. If the state is transient for the jumping process, then it is also transient for the continuous time process. And after we prove this theorem, the third theorem follows automatically because we know that for the discrete time mark of chain, either all states are recurrent or all states are transient. So for the continuous time case, this is also the, the case. So either all states are recurrent or all states are transient. So now, let us see how to prove this to theorem. Okay, so now for a fixed state X, we want to consider whether it is recurrent uh, transient at vertex x. So in, in, in order to look at this, we memorize what's, what's, what are the returning time to this vertex. So suppose our Markov chain starts from x. And tau 1 is the first time that the jumping process returned to x. And we define by induction that tau k plus, tau k plus 1 is the first time after tau k that the Markov chain going back to x. So this sequence tau k is just the sequence that is the sequence of time that we remember when the Markov chain, the, when the jumping process go back to x. Okay, so proof of the first statement. If x is recurrent for y, Then we know that this is equivalent to say that almost assuring tau 1 is finite. And then we can prove by induction so in fact almost assuredly tau k is finite for any k. So because if we know it is true for k, then we consider for k plus 1. So for k plus 1, it's just that we're given what happens after tau, tau 1. We know that tau 1 is almost surely finite. And then we, condition, we calculate the conditional probability that there is another k jumps after tau 1. And by induction, we know that it, that is also probability 1. So this shows that for any k, the probability tau k is finite is e equals 1. So this means once the Markov chain can almost surely go in back once, then in fact almost surely it will go in back infinitely many times. So from here we know that if we put intersect all this event K together, then its probability is, equals, is also one. So this shows that almost surely
almost surely tau k is finite for all k. So from this event, in fact, we know that for all k, almost surely tau k is finite. And if for this event, it means we can put k inside. So almost surely tau k is finite for all k. And since tau k is finite for all k, now let us define. Uh, OK, so tau k is finite for all k. So this means that for a fixed state x, the Markov chain jumping to this, uh, jumping back to this, to this state infinitely many times. And we also know that because we assume there is no explosion, so jn goes to infinity. So the jumping time, the jumping sequence goes to infinity. And this index is also goes to infinity. So combining these two, we know that So almost surely, this set is unbounded. OK, so this shows that if state x is recurrent for the Jeremy process, it is also recurrent for the continuous time process. And then we prove that if the state x is transient for the jumping process, then it is also transient for the continuous time process. So suppose that the state x is transient for y. Then we know that the probability of the return time is finite. Then this probability is strictly less than 1. And in the sa as the same as before, we can prove by induction that the probability for tau k is finite. It equals p to the power k. So just to repeat the same procedure as, uh, as in the above. OK, so now we sum it over all possible k then this probability is summable. And since it is summable by borel cantali lemma, We know that the event tau k is finite happens infinitely many times. This event has probability zero. So it is with probability zero that it happens infinitely many times. So this is also equivalent to say that with probability one, it only happens finitely many times. So we define big N is the last time that the jumping process visits us. Then from this, uh, from this calculation, we know that this N is finite almost surely. So almost surely, it's going back to X only for finite, finitely many times. So this big N is finite almost surely. And then let us go back to what happens to the continuous time. So for the continuous time process xt, we memorize where is the last uh, time that xt span at x. Then we know that big N is the jumping process of y so suppose this is the, this is t, and this is our state x. So big N is the last time that the jumping process stays at x. So this corresponds to, then this means that at time jn, we jump to the state x. And then we stay there for a while, and then we jump to another place. 
So here we see that and the next jumping time is gm plus 1. And this, so here we see that the last time that the Markov chain is at x uh, is bounded by gm plus 1. So this guy, this s, is bounded by gm plus 1. And now here we assume that x is transient for y. So of course, x can't be absorbing. Which means so qx has to be strictly positive. So x is not absorbing. Since x is not absorbing, then we know that after we jump to x at jn, then this jn can't be infinity. So if jn is infinity, then it means that the state x is, is absorbing. But now we already know that x can't be absorbing. So after jn, it has to jump at some finite time. So this implies that if n is finite, then jn plus 1 is mu uh, must be finite. So this shows that almost surely this time s is finite. So almost surely the time, almost surely this uh, time, the time that x span and x is, has to be bounded. So this shows that the state x is transient for the continuous time process. Okay, so this is the second notion, transients and the, transi uh, and the recurrence. Here we say that, so the continuous time Markov chain is transient or recurrent if and only if the jamming process is transient or recurrent. So now we have uh, go back to what happens to the discrete time case. We know that irreducible is just the same as in the continuous time case, and the transients and the recurrence is also the same as the discrete time case. And the next notion we talk about is the stationary measures. So this, but for this guy, then the discrete time and the continuous time will be different. So recall that if we know that mu is stationary measure for the discrete time Markov chain, suppose that mu is the stationary measure for a discrete time Markov chain with transition matrix Q, then what we know is mu times Q equals mu. And now we want to repeat the same definition for continuous time case. So now for continuous time case, we know that we replace this transition matrix Q by the transition semigroup PT. And we want to repeat this definition. So we want to define a stationary measure mu such that mu times PT equals mu. By now, this, prob uh, this definition will become problematic because here we just define mu to be the measure that mu times q equals mu. But for this guy, if we define mu is the measure that mu times pt equals mu, so there's no reason that maybe this mu depend on t. So if we replace another t, maybe we'll get another solution mu. So this is a not good, uh, this is not a good definition because, because it can be, prob because the solution that may depend on t, so we don't know at the bef uh, beforehand that it is independent of t. So this is not a good definition. So, but we can adjust this idea a little bit. So suppose we want to define mu times pt equals mu. And now we remove everything. I just move the right hand side to the left hand side. So now we want to define that mu is the measure that mu times pt minus i equals zero. Suppose this is true. Then we normalized this uh, quantity by t. 
and let t goes to infinity, uh, let t goes to zero. Then we know that pt minus i normalized by t will converge to the infinitesimal generator. So if mu, if this relation is true, then we know that mu times generator has to be zero. And now if we define mu as a measure such that mu times a is a zero, then this is a well-defined definition because the generator a doesn't depend, no longer depend on t anymore. So this is a good definition for stationary. So this is why we define for the continuous time case that for the continuous time, we say a measure is a stationary if mu times, if pi times a is zero. So, so a measure pi is a stationary for the continuous time mark of chain if pi times a equals zero. So this is the reason why we define it in this way, because this is a well-defined definition. And the first dilemma says, in fact, this definition is almost the same as what we want. So after we define that uh, pi times a equals zero, then in fact, we can derive that pi times pt equals pi. Okay, so suppose that mu is uh, stationary, and also suppose that our state space is finite. So later I will show that, uh, in fact, for the infinite case, infinite state space case, this is also true, but not at this stage. So lemma, suppose that our state space is finite, pi is a stationary, then we have that pi times pt equals pi for any t. So this tells us if the state space is finite, if we define the station, stationarity in this way, pi times a equals zero, then this is the same as what we want to say. So this is the same as it is the, sta it is the measure that pi times pt equals pi. So why this is true? And the only thing we can do is take derivative with respect to t. So pi times pt at a vertex x by definition is pi y times pt y x. And now we take derivative with respect to t. And here, since we just have a finite state space, then we can reverse the derivative in the summation. So we can put the derivative here. And for the transition semigroup PT, we know that the derivative is just a semi, uh, the, gener the infinitesimal generator. Times PT. So the derivative of PT is just, a, uh, is just a, the infinitesimal generator A times the matrix PT. So now what we have is it equals pi times A times PT at vertex X. And since pi times A equals zero, so the right hand side equals zero. So now what we know is for any fixed x, we take derivative with respect to t, then the derivative is always zero. And since we only have finitely many terms, so this implies that pi times ptx equals pi times p0x, so it equals its initial value. And for the initial value, p0 is just the identity matrix, so this is pi x. So this tells us pi times pt equals pi. So this lemma shows that if we define this, the measure to be stationary if pi times a equals zero, then it is the same as the way we want. So pi times pt equals pi. Okay, <clears throat> for the next dilemma, we will relate the stationary measure for the continuous time and the stationary measure for the discrete time, discrete jumping time. 
So now we have a measure pi, and we define a measure mu, another measure mu, in this way. So mu x is q x times pi x. So now we have two measures, pi and mu. And this conclusion says pi is a stationary for the continuous time if and only if this mu is a stationary for the jamming process. So this is the relation between the stationary measure for the continuous and the stationary measure for the discrete time of chain. So why this is true? Suppose pi is a stationary for the continuous. So this is equivalent to say that pi times a equals zero. So this is the definition for stationary measure for continuous time. And pi times a, so what is pi times a? Pi times a at one vertex it equals pi y times q y x. So it means that pi y times q y x is zero. And now for this q y x, there are two different cases. So y is a y equals x or y is distinct from x. And for y equals x, we know that this qxx is negative. And it equals minus qx. So now I just uh, decompose this summation according to y is x, or y, y is distinct from x, or y equals x. So now I remove this uh, second term to another part of the equation. So what we have is, Pi times a equals zero is equivalent to say pi y times q y x equals pi x times q x. So this is the this is the condition that pi is a stationary for continuous. And now let us check what is the condition for mu is a stationary for the discrete jamming process. So mu is a stationary for y. It is equivalent to say that mu times q equals mu, and this q is the transition matrix for y. So now if we write this q explicitly, so this q y x equals uh, big q y y x equals a small q y x normalized by q y and for y is distinct from x. And for y equals x, it equals zero, because this is a jamming process. It has to jump to another state. So if we plug in the definition of q, we know that mu times q equals mu is equivalent to say, So this is what this is the definition for mu is a stationary for y. So now we compare these two equation, and we see that if mu equals q x times pi x, then these two equation are exactly the same thing. So this shows that if pi and mu are related in this way, then pi is a stationary for x is equivalent to mu is a stationary for y. So this is the stationary measure. Now a quick summary of what we already have for the continuous and the discrete time case. So for x is the continuous time Markov chain and the y is the jumping Markov chain. Then we know that 
x is irreducible if and only if y is irreducible. x is recurrent if and only if y is recurrent. And finally, if x has a stationary measure pi, so this is pi times a is the definition for stationarity, and we define measure mu in this way, then we know that pi is stationary for x if and only if mu is stationary for the jumping process. A quick summary, and then we have a 10 minutes break, and we resume at 10 past 10. Okay, so we resume. In the last lecture, we talked about the relation between irreducible, a bit, the relation between continuous time mark chain and its jamming process, and we see that irreducible recurrent are exactly the, in, defined in the same way, and the stationary measure is just a little different. So just uh, to normalize this stationary measure to uh, to time a constant in order to get a stationary measure for the jam process. And next, we talk about positive recurrence. So just uh, a quick recall, what we have for the discrete time case, for the discrete time mark of chain, ym, how we define the positive recurrence. So we define that for a state x, tau x plus is the first time, first return time of the mark of chain. And we say that the mark of chain is positively recurrent if the expectation of this tau, of the first return time is finite. And then we show that if uh, yn is positive recurrent, so if positive recurrent, then we know that if only if there exists a stationary distribution, so positive recurrent, if and only if there exists a stationary distribution, And we also know how to construct this stationary distribution. So what we do is uh, just a quick recall of what we have there. So suppose we have positive recurrence. So we know that the first return time tau x plus is finite for some vertex x. And then we define a major mu tilde that is depending on x. So it is the number of visits of the mark of chain to y before the first return time tau x plus. And in the discrete time case, we show that this mu tilde is a stationary for y. And we also check that the total mass, the total mass of mu tilde it's just the expectation of this uh, tau x plus. And since it is finite, we can normalize this measure mu tilde by its total mass to get a probability measure. So then we define mu equals mu tilde normalized by the total mass. Then this measure mu is, the, is a stationary distribution. And it, there is also a proof that if we have a stationary distribution, then we must be positive recurrent. So this is what we have for the discrete time case. And now in the continuous time case, first we want to define positive recurrence in a similar way. So definition. Now we want to replace tau x plus by the first return time for the mark for the continuous time mark continuous time mark of chain. So we define Tx plus. It is the first time after the first jumping. So after the first jumping, we jump back to x. So this is, uh, this is the analog of tau x plus. So this is the first time that we at least has one jumping. So this is the first return time for the continuous time mark chain. And we say that 
the continuous time Markov chain X is positive recurrent. If the expectation of the first return time is finite. So here we say that this definition is just a parallel to what happens to the, to the discrete time case. And then we can also show this theorem. So the theorem is, this theorem is also parallel to what happens to the discrete time case. So the theorem says if the Markov chain is irreducible, then the following three statements are equivalent. First, every state is positive recurrent. Second, some state is positive recurrent. Third, the continuous time mark of chain has a stationary distribution. And then moreover, we know that any, uh, under any of the one, any one of the three statements, we know that the Markov chain is positive recurrent. And we can also write out the stationary distribution explicitly. So the stationary distribution pi x is given by this. So just uh, for the discrete time case, in fact, we know that The, for the discrete time case, the stationary measure, uh, we can also write out the explicit form of this stationary measure to equals this one. And in the continuous time, we have almost the same uh, formula. So it is one over the expectation of the discrete, of the first expectation of the first return time, but normalized by the constant at vertex x. Okay, so this is the statement. So of course, the first the statement implies the second. And we will prove how to go from the second to the third. So suppose that we have some state that is positive recurrent. Now we want to show that x has a stationary distribution. So the idea is exactly the same as for the discrete time case. So suppose some state is positive recurrent. So there exists some state x such that the expectation of first return time is finite. And now, similarly to the discrete term case, we define pi tuta This pi tuta is just uh, we calculate what's the expectation of a Markov chain spent at a vertex y before the first return time. So this is exactly parallel to what happens to the discrete. And the idea is we want to show this pi tuta is a stationary for x, and then we calculate what is the total mass, and then normalize this measure by the total mass to obtain a stationary distribution. So now how to show this pi tuta is a stationary with respect to X. So we, we prove this by showing that this pi tuta is related to the mu tuta in the right way. And then the, since mu tuta is a stationary for y, then this pi tuta is a stationary for x. So let us see what's the relation between pi tuta and the mu tuta. This is pi tuta. So pi tuta, it, is, it calculates uh, how many time, how much time the Markov chain spent at a, a vertex y before the first return time. So now suppose this is our Markov chain. So it is a jumping process.
and we want to calculate how much time it is spent at a vertex y. So suppose this is our vertex y, this is the state y. And then this interval corresponds to the time that the Markov chain is spent at y. So then what we know here is if uh, this is the state y, then we know that at this jumping time, we know that the jumping process jumped to y. And then the continuous time spent the time as n plus 1 at this vertex. So as n plus 1 is just a difference between jn plus 1 minus jn. So it's the time that the Markov chain spent at this vertex y before it jumps again. So what we know here is so I replace this by infinity and put an indicator here. And then what we know is So in fact, what we have is So the integral of time, so the total amount of the time of continuous Markov chain span at the vertex x, then it just equals for the jumping process is jump to y. After it jumps to y, it will stay there for the time s n plus 1. And now let us check what is the, this expectation. So we calculate First, the probability of yn equals y, n happens before the first return time, times the expectation of sn plus 1, knowing that yn equals y, and n is before the first return time. And here, for the second part, we know that because this is a continuous Markov chain, we know, if we know that we jump to y at some point, then this is a new Markov chain starting from y. And this Sn plus 1 is just a holding time at this state. So we know that this Sn just has the law of exponential with parameter qy. So the expectation of this exponential is 1 over qy. And then for the summation, here we already say that this 1 over qy has nothing to do with n. So we are just summing over all possible n, and this summation is exactly mu tilde y. This mu tilde is defined here, so it's just uh, calculating the number of visits of the jamming process to a state y before the first return time. Okay, so this is the relation between pi tilde and the mu tilde. And since we know that we know from the previous lemma about the stationary measure, we know that pi tilde is a stationary for x if and only if mu tilde is a stationary for y. So now we already know that mu tilde is a stationary for y. So by this lemma, we know that pi tilde is a stationary for x. So this shows that pi tilde is a stationary. And then let us check what's the total mass. So pi tilde y is the 
the total mass. So pi tilde y is the time that x is spent at one vertex before the first return time. After we're summing over all possible y, then in fact we'll just integrate, integrate uh, one indicator function from zero to, t to tau x plus to tx plus. So this, is, this integral is just the tx plus. So the total mass of pi theta is the expectation of tx plus. And by the assumption, we already assume that this guy is finite. So because we assume it is positively recurrent at this vertex x, so this is finite. Since it is finite, we can define the normalized measure. So we define So we define the measure, then we know that this pi is a stationary distribution. Okay, so now, so we just proved how to go from second to the third, and next we need to show how to go from third to the first. So now assume that X has a stationary distribution. And we want to show that every state is positive recurrent. So I will prove the conclusion on the under the assumption that our generator is bounded. So in fact, if you don't have such an assumption, the statement is still true. You can carefully check how to how we proved for the discrete time case, and you can check after if you check uh, carefully and replace the necessary changement in the discrete time case, you can also show how to go from the third to the second. But on Blackboard, I will prove this theorem under the assumption that A is bounded. Just because when A is bounded, the proof will be much shorter. So by A is bounded, I mean that This QZ is bounded by some universal constant C for any Z. So under this assumption, I will show that if X has a stationary distribution, then in fact Y also has a stationary distribution. And then for Y, our ever state is positive recurrent. And then we prove that for X, ever state is also positive recurrent. Okay, so suppose X has a stationary measure pi. Then from the lemma, we know that if we define mu hat as QX times pi X, we know that mu hat is stationary for Y. And we also see that the total mass of mu hat since this QZ is bounded by C, so it is bounded by C summing over all possible Z. And since this is a probability measure, so semi over all, the total mass of pi is one. 
So we know that the total mass is bounded by C, and it is finite. Since it is finite, we can define the normalized measure. Normalized by the total mass. Then we know that this measure is the stationary distribution for Y. For the discrete time Markov chain Y, we know that the stationary distribution is unique. So for the discrete time Markov chain Y, we know that the stationary distribution can also be written as tut new tutor normalized by its total mass. So this two new tutor normalized by its total mass has to equal QY times pi Y normalized by its total mass because the for discrete time Markov chain we already show that the stationary distribution is unique. So this tells us this mu tutor is just a constant. So this uh, Q, uh, mu hat, this mu, uh, mu hat has to be a constant times mu tutor. And then let us check what, are the, what is this constant. So suppose we set y equals x, then we know that for the left hand side, mu tutor x equals 1. So the left hand side equals c, and the right hand side equals mu x times pi x. Pi x. So this tells us, in fact, we already know that the relation between pi and the mu tutor is this one. So we know that we must have qy times pi y equals qx times pi x times mu tutor. And here the definition of mu tutor depends on x. So I should, I should keep this part. Uh, what do we know? So mu tutor. This is how we define this mu tutor. So mu tutor is the expectation of the discrete time jump chain, jump, the, man, the number of visits to y before the first return time. And since the uniqueness of stationary distribution, we know that qy times pi y equals a constant times mu tutor. And we can define, we can find what is this constant by evaluate what happens to both sides at vertex x. And we see here we see that this, this constant has to be qx times pi x. So this is what we have. We know that if pi is a stationary for x, then we know pi y has to just, uh, it's just a uh, mu tutor y normalized by qy times a constant. And from the proof of the first part, here, we know that this pi tutor y equals 1 over qy times mu tutor. So this is what we proved in the first part. So we plug in here what we have as So what we have is, if pi is a stationary, then this pi is a constant times pi tutor. And then we sum it over y to the both sides. Then for the right hand side, since pi is a probability measure, so for the right hand side, after we sum it over y, it equals one. And for the right hand side, We sum it over y of pi tutor y, and the, pi, the total mass of pi tutor y we just derived. It is the expectation of the first return time. So here, what we know is one equals q x times pi x 
time, the expectation of the first return time. So here we already see that if we have a stationary measure pi, then this guy has to be finite because pi times this quantity equals one, so it can't be infinite. And we also know that there, in fact, there exists a unique stationary measure. So this stationary measure has to have the form of this type. Okay, so this is how we show that if the Markov chain has a stationary measure, then every state is positive recurrent. And we also derive that the stationary measure is unique and it has to have this form. And finally, in this theorem, I will also explain that if measure pi is a stationary, it's, uh, it's the stationary distribution, then we have pi times pt equals pi. So we already proved that this is true when the state space is finite. And now I prove that if we are under the condition that positive recurrent, so if pi is a stationary probability measure, we can also show that pi times pt equals pi. So finally, we just prove we prove pi times pt equals pi. And for, since from the theorem, we already know that this pi has the unique form. It has to be of that form. And we also know that this pi is just a pi tilde normalized by the, the total mass. So in order to show pi times pt, it is equivalent to show that pi tilde times pt equals pi tilde, because pi is just a pi tilde normalized by a constant. So then let us check what is pi tilde times pt. So by definition, this is definition of pi tilde y. And now we decompose this integral to two parts. So for some fixed t, I decompose this integral from zero to t and from t to tau x plus, tx plus. So here, if t is less than tx plus, so now there is just a two part of the integral. If t is greater than tx plus, then this part will become negative. So this is still uh, true, no matter t is smaller or greater than tx plus. And then let us check the first part. So for the first integral, what we do is we start the Markov chain from starting from x. We, ca we calculate the integral from time zero to t. So now, if, we, if I replace this term integral from 0 to t to tx plus to t plus tx plus, the same integral, because this is a Markov chain. From x, we, we check what happens between 0 and t. This is the same that we're starting from this tx plus, because now we know that the Markov chain is a new Markov chain starting from x. tx plus 2, t plus tx plus. So if we merge them together, what we have is from t to t plus tx plus. And now I just change the variable, so I change s by t plus s. 
So nothing's changed, I just change the variable. And now I put this integral outside. I just put this integral outside, so switch the order of the expectation of the integral. And now let's check what happens here. So now we know that s is less than tx plus, and we calculate the probability for x t plus s. So now we decompose this Markov chain according to time s. I just decompose what happens to xs. And now here we see that for this part of the event, xs equals z and s is less than tx plus. They are all measurable with respect to what happens before time s. And here, in fact, we know that at time s, we are, we, we are a new mark of chain starting from z. And we are calculating what's the probability for xt equals y. And then again, I switch the order of this integral and this summation. And here we say that this quantity has nothing to do with us. So we integral what happens for us. Then we say that this is exactly pi tilde z. And so this tells us pi tilde equals pi tilde times pt. Okay, so now we complete the proof of the theorem. So we basically we show that what happens for the continuous time is the same as what happens to the discrete time. So even so at least for the definition of irreducible and the recurrent, they are exactly the same. And for the, stage, for the positive recurrent, we know that the conclusion is parallel to what happens to the discrete time. And after we checked everything for the stationary distribution, we can also show that this stationary measure has the right form we want. So it is exactly, it is exactly a measure such that pi times pt equals pi. So if our measure starts from pi, then the marginal law for any fixed time t is also pi. So next, we see the ergodic theorem and the convergence theorem. So these two theorem are exactly what we have for the discrete time case. And now I tell you that it is still the case for the continuous time case. So it is not surprising. So first, ergodic theorem. So for the ergodic theorem, suppose x is uh, irreducible. And it has a stationary distribution pi. Then this is exactly the same as what we have in the discrete time case. So it says that the average over time will converge to the stationary distribution. So for any function f, we consider So we first integral what happens from time 0 to t and normalize by t. So this is the average over the time. 
and it converge almost surely to the stationary distribution. So this is exactly the same as the discrete time case. And here you can also check that the proof for the discrete time can be, can be it works uh, line by line here. Okay, so this is the Gaudic theorem. I won't prove it because you can check that the proof for the discrete works line by line here. And then convergence theorem. So for the convergence theorem, the conclusion says if x is irreducible with generator A, and it has a stationary distribution pi, then we know that the marginal law will converge to the stationary distribution point, point wise. So for any x and y, we know that ptxy Converge to the stationary measure almost uh, no, as t goes to infinity. So the marginal law, so suppose our market chain starts from x, then pt xy is the marginal law of xt. And this probability measure converges to the stationary measure pointwise. This is also the same what, of what happens for the discrete time case, but the only difference is. Uh, can you remember what happens to what, what, what is the statement for the discrete time case? So in the discrete time case, we'll assume that the Markov chain is irreducible, has a stationary measure, and it is also aperiodic. And then we can prove the convergence theorem. And if there is no condition of aperiodic, this conclusion is wrong. And in the continuous time case, you see that I didn't say anything about aperiodic. Why? Because we know that once the Markov chain is irreducible, then PTXY is, pos is strictly positive for any T, so it is automatically uh, auto uh, aperiodic. So this is why I didn't state it in the theorem, in the statement. So proof convergence theorem. So X is irreducible with a stationary measure pi. Then we will show that the marginal law will converge to pi pointwise. So in fact, what we do is we have two steps. First, we will use the conclusion for the discrete time case to show that for any s positive, p and s x y will converge to pi y as n goes to infinity. So, because this is what uh, if we view a, a discrete time Markov chain with transition matrix p s, then this is p and s. So it's just uh, the marginal law of of, y, of z n and it will converge the stationary distribution. This is what happens for the discrete time case. And the second step, I will show that pt xy will converge to y, p pi y. So roughly speaking, I will compare pt to p and s and show that the difference between the two is very small. Okay, first, how to show, how to derive the conclusion for the discrete time case. We fix any S that is strictly, pos strictly positive. And suppose that Zn is a discrete time Markov chain with transition matrix Ps. And since X is irreducible, We know that P as XY is a strictly positive for any XY. So this implies that Z is aperiodic. It is irreducible and aperiodic. Next. Since, pi, since x has a stationary distribution, pi, then 
Then we just show that pi times ps equals pi. So this pi is also a stationary measure for z. So now we have checked the three conditions we need for the discrete time case. It is irreducible, aperiodic, and it has a stationary distribution. Then by the conclusion, by the convergence theorem for discrete time Markov chain, we conclude that, so combining these two, we conclude that for Zn, we have P and S converge to the stationary measure as n goes to infinity. So this is the first step. And the second step, so we will show that if this ns is very close to t, then p ns is very close to pt. So now we need to evaluate what happens with the difference between t plus s and pt. So first, I will show that the difference between these two is very small when s is very small. So first, I will show that the difference between p t plus s and p t is bounded by a functional in s. And when s goes to zero, it shows that these two conditions are very close. So why this is true? So we want to compare p t plus s and p t. So we can host the first quantity according to p s. And in fact, we know that if s is very small, then the probability p s x z, so with high probability that it concentrates at z equals x, and with a small probability that uh, it, 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 so when z is distinct from s, this quantity is very small, and when z equals x, this is very close to one. So we just decompose what, uh, according to z equals x, or z is distinct from x. So I just uh, uh, picked the term for z equals x out. And here we see that this, here we have a ptxy, and here we also have a ptxy. I just uh, rewrite the second part. What we have is So now I have done nothing. I just decompose according to what happens at time s, and then check which term is small and which term is large. So we want to show that this quantity is very small when s is very small. So now we, so this is the first term, and this is the second term. So we just uh, bound these two terms separately. So this is bounded by this two term. So now all the term, the quantity here is a positive. So it is, uh, it is just uh, bounded by this two term separately. So first of all, for the second term, we know that this is a probability. So since it is probability, it's bounded by one. 
And for the second term, because we know that this x is, uh, uh, this is the probability for the Markov chain starts from x, and at time s, it is still x. And we know that for the jumping process, the holding time has exponential law with parameter qx. So for when s is very small, we know that this probability will decay like e to the power minus qs. So probably I should also put a OS term here. Okay, so for the second term, we know that it is bounded by one minus e to the power qxs plus an OS term. So this OS means you can, it is also possible that you jump from x to y and jumping back with, with respect, uh, within time, within time s, but that part will have very small probability according to the first term. This is the second part. For the first part, we know that, again, this PTZY is a probability, so it is bounded by one. So now we are summing over the first term. And for the first term, so we start from X, we sum over all possible Z that Z is distinct from X. So this is exactly one minus PS xx. So again, this term is also bounded by this one. So this shows that the difference between pt plus s and a pt is bounded by twice times, the, times this constant. So here we see that as s goes to zero, these two terms are very close. So now we can go back to the proof of our theorem. We want to show that PTXY converges to pi y. So for any t and s small, we define n is the constant, is the integer part of t over s. And then we already know that PTXY minus pi y is bounded by P and S minus pi y plus P T X y minus P and S X y. And from the calculation here, we know that this second term is bounded by two times one minus E minus Q X S. So here we first let t goes to infinity. Then we know that the first term converges to zero. And then let s goes to zero. The second term converges to zero. So this proves that ptxy converges to pi y. So this proves the convergence theorem for the continuous time case. And this is the end of uh, today's lecture and also the end of this semester, the, the lecture of this semester. And later we will have an exercise session about uh, positive recurrence. So there you will calculate, X, calculate the, pos uh, the stationary distribution for MM1Q and mm infinity q and uh, several other examples. Okay.